Welcome to the Applied Materials blog. I am Mehul Nayak, Principal Member of Technical Staff with the Transistor and Interconnect Group. Today I will discuss the exciting changes happening in interconnects that are the lifeline of silicon chips which enable everything from mobile devices to laptops to servers that power the cloud and in future will be key to the success of artificial intelligence, augmented or virtual reality, and self-driving cars. Now the history of semiconductor industry is characterized by making things smaller, faster, and cheaper, as well as more energy efficient. In the early 90s, we had mobile phones that were the size of an elongated brick, and it took about five hours to charge them for one hour of talk time. We have seen those evolve into the smartphones of today that have the competing power of the desktop of 20 years ago. Social media has exploded. In 60 seconds on the internet, upwards of 20 million WhatsApp messages are exchanged and more than 2 million YouTube videos are seen. Incredibly, this represents just a fraction of what happens on the internet in one minute. All of these new applications, devices, and end markets have been enabled to density, performance, and bandwidth scaling of the all-pervasive silicon chips, which are really at the heart of every electronic device that we use. Now, the semiconductor industry also has a vision in future, which belongs to artificial intelligence, to augmented and virtual reality, and to self-driving cars. To make this future a reality, the humble silicon chip needs to become even faster, cheaper, and consume even less energy. Now, one of the key components of a silicon chip that can put a spanner in the works of this future is the interconnect that carries the instructions from the transistor. In the late 90s, the conductor used in high-performance silicon chips changed from aluminum to copper, and copper has now remained the workhorse for the last 20 years. In the future, to continue on scaling path to enable faster, cheaper, more energy efficient devices, new conductors will supplant copper due to its limitations at incredibly small sizes. While it is still uncertain which conductor will win, today we will focus on one of the leading candidates. So with that background in mind, now let's take a step back and understand the role of the transistor and the interconnect in a silicon chip. In simplest terms, transistors are the brains of a chip. These transistors need to electrically communicate to each other. Then an interconnect is nothing but a copper wire that helps transfer electrical signals from one transistor to another. The lower the resistance of the copper wire, the faster and farther the signal can travel. Now let me refer to this micrograph on the right, which shows a cross-section of the processor used in Samsung mobile phones. The metallization that we are discussing today is represented by the dark objects, while the lighter portions are dielectrics that electrically isolate the metal wires. At the very bottom, you have the transistors, which you can't really see. These transistors are finely tuned engines where processes of a device takes place. Above the transistor, we have the copper wires that help transfer the signal from one transistor to the other transistor. We'll also notice that there are many levels of these copper wires, and the size of the copper wire actually increases as you climb the high rise, so to speak. You can also see that there's a contact layer in between the transistor and the interconnect, but we won't be discussing this further today. Now let's now focus on the transistor and talk about the transistor a little bit. All the mobile devices and social media that we enjoy today were enabled by scaling. In other words, by making the transistor smaller and smaller. As a result, the number of transistors in a silicon chip has increased from a few millions in the early 90s to the many billions today. Now to facilitate signal transfer among these billions of transistors, copper wires also had to become smaller and smaller, as the silicon chip would be too large uh, to fit into the mobile devices of today. The problem that we face is that while transistor performance improves as the size reduces, copper wire resistance actually increases as the wire gets smaller and smaller, and this degrades the performance significantly. Now as a consumer, you, know, as you and me, why should we care about this? Well, when the wire resistance increases, the signal transfer between the transistors slows down. The signal just doesn't travel as far. The end result is a silicon chip that is slower and that consumes more power, which is really not what you want in AR, VR, and self-driving cars. What has happened is that the copper wire has now become the bottleneck. So essentially, we have a transistor that's like a Bugatti. It's fast, it's raring to go, but then we have the slow copper wire that not only restricts the speed to a crawl, but also rapidly empties the gas tank. So to continue on the scaling path, interconnect performance improvement is mandatory. Now let's take a closer look to see why copper wire resistance increases as the size decreases. 
This will clue us in on what to look for when choosing a replacement conductor. As you can see from this video, copper interconnect, which at 15 nanometer CD, is half the size of a virus cell, requires several other materials in order to function. Additionally, the interconnect is composed of two different sections, the copper trench or the wire, the transfer signal within the same level, and the via, which transfers signal from level to level. It is important that both the wire and the via resistance be low for efficient signal transfer. Now within this structure, there's a barrier film composed of tantalum nitride that is required to contain copper within the structure. There's also a very thin layer of cobalt film deposited, which helps to make sure that one can fill the structure completely with copper without any imperfections. Both tantalum nitride and cobalt reduce the amount of copper that can fit into the wire. The less the copper in the wire, the slower the signal will move through the wire and slower the speed of the silicon chip. Now, as we reduce the size of the wire, the tantalum nitride and cobalt thicknesses cannot be scaled down significantly, which means that as the wire gets smaller, the amount of copper in it decreases much faster than the size of the wire, and the signal transfer starts exponentially slowing down. Now, we talked about the wire resistance. What about the VR resistance, the structure that connects the level to level? For lower VR resistance, the resistance and thickness of materials at the bottom of VIA needs to be minimized. Now, there is another reason why the wire resistance increases as the size decreases, and that's related to the mean free path. In simple terms, mean free path is the distance that an electron travels between collisions in a metal that is unconstrained by boundaries. For copper, this distance is 39 nanometers. Now, why is this mean free path important? Well, if the size of the copper wire approaches the mean free path, then the copper electrons begin scattering more often from the different surfaces and the grain boundaries. And this scattering increases the resistivity of copper. With high resistivity, signals will now travel slower and for a shorter distance, and performance degrades. We'll clarify the impact of mean free path in a couple of minutes. So to summarize this discussion, volume of copper decreases and resistivity of copper increases as the wire becomes progressively smaller. As a result, Interconnect resistance is expected to increase by close to a factor of nine as we scale from 10 to five nanometer node. In the next two slides, we will see the characteristics of cobalt that make it a viable candidate to replace copper as the interconnect metal. While other metals such as ruthenium and nickel are under consideration, at this time, cobalt deposition is more mature process for semiconductor manufacturers to put into production. In the previous slide, we talked about the volume effect that causes wire resistance to increase. Let's now focus on the wire portion in the schematic shown here. As you can see from the numbers on the slide, the fraction of the wire that is copper drops from 50% to 33% as the wire shrinks from 24 nanometer to 15 nanometer, which happen to be representative dimensions for the 10 and five nanometer node respectively. The reduction in the amount of copper, the conducting metal in the trench or the wire causes the resistance to go up. Now imagine if you were to remove the liner, thin down the barrier, and increase the thickness of the conducting metal such that it fills almost the entire structure. Well, this is possible using cobalt as the interconnect metal. With cobalt, the expected volume of the conducting metal jumps to 87% as compared to 33% with copper as the conducting metal in the trenches. Now, why is this possible, and who really made this possible? Well, this was made possible by the work done in applied materials, where it was demonstrated that unlike copper, if one uses cobalt to fill the structure, a single film can be used both as a barrier and as a fill promoter, and that this film can be as thin as one nanometer. Contrast that to the two film requirement for copper, one for the barrier and one for the liner, neither of which can scale, and one can easily understand why cobalt is attractive as a copper replacement. It facilitates a larger volume of the conducting metal at a given wire size. Now, as it turns out, this is not the whole story. While the volume of conducting metal did increase significantly, it is not a given that a cobalt-based wire will have lower resistance than copper, especially when we consider that cobalt bulk resistivity is higher than that of copper. So the missing piece of the puzzle here is the concept I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the mean free path. Now, if you recall, copper has a mean free path of 39 nanometer. And as we approach wire sizes substantially below 39 nanometer, copper electron scattering increases 
and copper resistivity increases significantly. The end result is the near exponential increase in copper wire resistance below about 20 nanometer CD as seen in this chart. Cobalt, on the other hand, has a mean free path that is about four times lower than that of copper. What this means is that cobalt wire can be scaled down much farther than a copper wire without a significant increase in electron scattering. Practically, this means that even though cobalt bulk resistivity is higher than that of copper, its lower mean free path results in less size-induced resistivity increase. And based on the data collected by the applied materials team, the cobalt wire resistance will eventually be lower than copper when wire sizes shrink below 10 to 12 nanometer critical dimension. This is the so-called copper-cobalt crossover. In other words, cobalt becomes attractive as copper replacement at CDs below 10 to 12 nanometer. At larger CDs, cobalt wire resistance will be higher than copper wire resistance in spite of the larger conducting metal volume as copper bulk resistivity is lower than that of cobalt and electron scattering is not as important with the increase in wire sizes. Thus, cobalt will be implemented first in the lowest levels of metallization where we have the smallest wires and where the crossover will take place. Copper will then continue to be used in the larger, higher level wiring. Now, not only does cobalt result in lower wire resistance below a certain wire size, but we should also expect lower wear resistance through minimizing the thickness of the high resistivity films at the bottom of the via. So with that, I'm very excited to have been able to share with you this development by the Applied Materials Cobalt team. The next few years will be an exciting time as we see major inflections in how we use everyday objects like phones to immerse us in virtual reality and cars to drive us without any human input. Applied Materials is at the forefront of materials engineering needed to make these technology transitions occur. And we will continue to lead with materials inflections that are required to make possible the devices of tomorrow. This concludes the video blog. Thank you for your attention.